Hello, welcome to the DevForce Bookshelf Architectural Tour. I'm Ward Bell, your host and VP of Technology at IdeaBlade. And right now you're looking at the bookshelf in action. Sometimes it's known as the book club because that's the title here, but the solution name is Bookshelf. And I hope you've seen it before. It was first presented by John Papa at PDC 2010 in his Kung Fu MVVM show. And then it appeared several times at the really marvelous uh, Firestarter, Silverlight Firestarter, in December of 2010. Urge you to go see those videos. I'll have links to all of these videos and links to the bits that you see here and other things uh, in a slide at the end of this video. But because I've hoped you've seen it before and you know some of the concepts of MVVM and so forth, uh, I'll briefly show you that it does work with DevForce. Hey, here we are waiting, and then yes, the book business uh, book show. Here's the technology books, the business book show now because they're cached. Quickly, uh, I go back here. Yes, you can see I'm already signed in, which means the edit button is lit, which means I can go edit it, and if I like whack the title, uh, that's required, and it says so, so validation is working with DevForce. Here's something new. If I cancel this, it will actually revert, which is something that doesn't happen uh, in the current bookshelf. Uh, I urge you to go see uh, one of those demonstrations to learn more, but this is the application we're building. This is the application we've converted to DevForce, and I want to show it to you. Uh, the bits, by the way, also include a, an extensive document that uh, takes you through all the migration uh, steps that you would need to do. And, and you know, it's, it's not because it takes so long to do the migration, but because uh, we explain a number of concepts along the way. Because not only did we um, convert this application, we also refactored it in ways, some of which perhaps could be done with RIA services, but many of which are made possible by IdeaBlade's DevForce, and I want to show those things to you. Here's the solution. Uh, you may notice that there are more projects here than there were in the resurfaces version. That's not because it's more complicated or you need them. It's because we've added some features that we'll be talking about. But most of it's the same. We have a library which actually holds the MVVM light libraries, uh, the DLLs that were used by John. This is uh, John's common helper classes. No changes to that. This is the Silverlight application itself. This is the website. And these are the two new ones uh, that we've introduced. This one so that we can t test the view model. And this one will come into play when we talk about some of the opportunities and improvements we've made to designing with data. So let's drill in right now into the web project to see what's different there. The web project builds a server that actually serves two purposes. One of them is to deliver the Silverlight client application to the browser, and the other is to provide the domain services, uh, the, the persistent services to the client application. We'll find the, the Silverlight application in the client bin. Actually, there are two zaps there. One of them is the bookshelf, that's the running application, and the other is, uh, is our test suite. So we'll be getting to that later for sure. And uh, you need some host pages, so default HTML. This, this is a little renamed um, relative to the RIA services version of this application. We call it default because that's the default page and that runs the bookshelf application. And then we have a host page for the tests. Um, this is the web config. Everybody has one, but you'll uh, poke into that at your leisure and realize just how much simpler that is in DevForce. Here is our services folder, and this will be a bit of a surprise because as you can see, there's just one service in here. Uh, that's a, an optional uh, registration service if you were going to during login, the login process, if you want people to be able to register as new users. But otherwise, we don't have the equivalent of a domain service. We don't need the equivalent of a domain service uh, in DevForce. You don't create all those insert, update, and delete service methods. Um, it's much more like actually um, like WCF data services in, in this regard where, where most of the time that stuff's generated. Now, of course, you can enrich uh, the server side with services, optional services if you wish, uh, but uh, only as you need them. So that could be a little bit of a surprise, but that's DevForce for you. 
here we are about to check out the models and as I open that up we also see that this is a little sparer than you may be expecting. Uh, yes we have an EDMX and it's uh, very much like the one you would have seen in Reed Services but look at this there's a custom T4 template this comes from um, DevForce generated by DevForce uh, because what we do is we take the EDMX and we generate DevForce entities out of that there's the class where those entities reside and it is these entities that are actually the ones you use that ship over the wire we do not as does RIA services take the EF generated classes and make yet a new set of generated classes on the server side that's not how we do it uh, we only need one set of classes on the server side and uh, as we'll find out these are exactly the same classes that are used on the Silverlight client uh, we've mimicked the RIA services pattern here of putting any kind of extensions of the classes uh, into a shared file. Uh, but unlike RIA services, this one is quite brief. We don't need that big metadata file. Uh, we only put things in here that uh, where we want to customize an entity, uh, such as we can do here with book, uh, and create some special custom property. Uh, yes, you can add uh, validation through this mechanism and through a metadata buddy class style, uh, but you, uh, you'll find that DevForce has generated many of those for us, and so we don't have to do any of the custom ones unless we actually have some validation logic we'd like to add to this. Uh, so this is, a, as I said, very much more spare uh, than you might have been expecting. Uh, here's where the database is, same as within the original. And that wraps up kind of what's happening on the web project side. Uh, next, we will take a look at what's going on in the um, Silverlight application project. The Silverlight application project structure is identical, as far as I remember, to the original. We'll take a quick high-level tour of it. Uh, it's pretty much broken down by function. There are some assets, visual assets, among them the books, which are uh, resources uh, rather than coming from the database as they would in a real application. And the rest of this came from the uh, business application template or BAT it was the foundation for the original and that we modified to pull out the RIA services and put the DevForce in, uh, modified only slightly. So it, it's pretty much the same. Uh, controls are part of the BAT and the design and model and design services we'll talk to in a little bit, but they help with design time data. Uh, there are some helper classes. There's one library, the data forum toolkit, which is not even used, I believe. These are MVVM messages, part of that the messenger uh, protocol that uh, for, for event aggregator and there's one new message uh, which we'll talk about perhaps uh, but in case we neglect it it's it handles the pop-up dialogue that provides some information and asks the user to press yes or no uh, the models I'm gonna look at in a second which is the domain model parallel to the domain model on the website and the services are the services, mostly their services to go get those models, but they do a few other things. Again, we'll look at that. Our views are here. The view models behind them are there. The view models is the same number. We have the same two in a view model locator as before, and the views haven't changed either. Um, behind the scenes in the login, that was again from the bat, and we had to make some slight changes for DevForce, but that all came uh, pretty easily and was not terribly interesting. Uh, and and they, certainly the variety of these hasn't changed. Uh, and then some web resources and, and so forth. So uh, that's the overview. We're going to start with the model to see what uh, the domain objects look like and the way you interact with them looks like. And then we'll circle back to the top of the application and work backwards into the services. The models folder should look a little bit different to you. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the number of files here that have shortcuts, the error is the same error CS that was there before, but these others have shortcuts, which means they point to files elsewhere, and that elsewhere is down here in the web. You'll see that it, the models folder there exactly parallels in structure, well, almost exactly. Um, the uh, generated uh, EF entities are right there, the entity classes, and that's the shortcut to them. 
Um, but you, you get the idea. Uh, what's happening here is that they're the same physical source code, simply recompiled this time uh, against the the Silverlight DLLs. Uh, there is no hidden uh, generated code uh, as there is in RIA services. If you were to do show all, um, you're not going to see any generated code file uh, lurking back here. It's just the same stuff, so uh, you're not dealing with uh, entities that sort of kind of maybe look like the ones on the server side. Nope, they're word for word identical. And so with that said, we will now proceed to figuring out how this application works and sort of drive down through the views back towards the model. There was one minor change in the app.xaml code behind. In the startup, we used to see a web context. Here you'll see a, an authentication manager current load user. Um, that's because the DevForce authentication manager takes the place of the web context from RIA services. That aside, if we were to look at the app XAML, exactly the same. Uh, you may wonder how this all kicks off. If you recall John's lecture, the object resource dictionary in the assets does one thing that's really interesting. It instantiates something called the view model locator. Before drilling into the view model locator, let's, let's refresh a little bit about why we have a view model locator. Uh, and John covered this in his uh, Kung Fu MVVM. Uh, in this style of uh, MVVM development, uh, we favor development of views in, uh, with visual design tools like Blend. And that means we're going to let the XAML uh, bind to a view model, and in order to do that it has to either create one, which is a terrible idea, or it has to find one, and that's what the view model locator is going to do. It's going to uh, help it find one. And uh, notice, by the way, the locator keyword here. So to sort of see how that works, let's, let's take a look at a view. We'll uh, look at the book view. And notice the data context here. It, uh, it has a static resource locator. That'll get the view model locator. And then it binds to a property of that uh, locator called book which I can assure you will return the book view model, which goes with the book view. Uh, notice that it's a data context, pure and simple, uh, which means that this logic will be executed both within the visual design tools and at runtime. So the view model locator is going to deliver the goods uh, in both contexts. Now that we know that, we can close some of this business up and go take a look at the view model locator itself, which is in the view model section. And I'm going to scroll right to the property. There it is, book. Um, book, it's an auto property, and it just returns a book view model, so as promised. And then below it is checkout, which returns a checkout view model. Uh, we have two view models in the application. We have two view model properties. That's the way the view model locator pattern works. Uh, looking at checkout for a second, we see that every time uh, a view gets one, it gets a new one, a new checkout view model that uh, is instantiated, and it's instantiated with a book data service. Uh, the nice thing about this pattern also is that I can construct view models that have um, multiple parameters, have services injected into them, and uh, that's something you couldn't do if you were uh, uh, trying to construct this inside the XAML. Uh, one thing that is different is that the logic for starting up the view model has been pulled out into a start method. Um, that's an architectural decision of ours uh, because we've learned that it's, it's generally not a great idea if the constructor of a view model does anything more than wires things up. Uh, it's best that uh, outside something calls the start so that we can separate those two moments of wiring and starting, because starting usually means run off to the database and do something. Uh, book, we can tell there's going to only be one of them, and uh, it's constructed inside the view model locators constructor. Uh, here it is, new book view model. It's, um, it, it takes a few more parameters than the simple checkout view model. It takes that same book data service too. That book data service is going to be important. That's the way it gets data from the database or from the design time. And uh, it's got another a new one called the security service, um, which uh, we probably won't get into, but was just an architectural decision about the way in which a view model should learn about whether the user was authenticated or not. And then it takes um, a third service, which is the book editor, and I believe that was in the original. Uh, and then a call start. 
So uh, the mystery here now is where do these surfaces come from? Again, John explained this. We haven't changed that. It's in the surface provider base, uh, which we're actually getting from a singleton. If you see a singleton in this kind of context, you know that we're not using dependency injection, something we might do in the future, but for simplicity, that wasn't done. If we go take a look at the service provider, uh, again, it's very much as John left it. Uh, if there's an instance already, we return it. If not, we create it. Uh, how do we create it? We check if we're in the design tools. And if we're in the design tools, then we're going to use the design service provider. If we're in runtime, we use the runtime service provider here. Uh, that leaves only what services the service provider knows about, which, which by the way, that we'll know about them because the whatever inherits from service provider base is actually going to set these properties. Uh, and as I said, the, ser the security service is new. The entity manager provider service is really new, and we'll get into that because that's how DevForce does its job. Um, which is to provide an entity manager to the book data service. But we'll explain that in a second. Now that you have this overview of how we go from view to view model locator, which returns a view model, which depends upon services being injected, and here are these services. Uh, actually, I think we're, we're ready to go look at services. There are only two flavors of uh, service provider base. There's the design service provider when we're in the design time tools like Blend, and then there's the service provider. So let's go look at those. We'll, we'll, we'll close up the tabs first, and we'll go over and we will find under services, we will find our runtime service provider. And under design services, I promised we'd get here, uh, we find our design service provider. In order to make this a little easier, we'll put one over the other so we can see just how different or not they are. Um, there are four services. The any manager provider uh, we'll be learning about. You can see that there's a, um, a runtime one called entity manager provider and a design time one uh, for the design service. We then go to the next line and uh, book data service. Notice that actually uh, we're using the same book data service in the real world and in the design time. They're only differing in which entity manager is created for them. And that's something new. We, we don't need, in uh, now that we have DevForce, we don't need two distinct book data services that we have to maintain. We'll be able to change the behavior for design or runtime simply by swapping the entity manager that they use. That's going to be a, a big saving as we go forward. Um, then there's a difference between the regular security service and the design security service. The difference being that the design security service just forces the kind of user, an authenticated user, uh, for design time. And the design service doesn't need a book editor, uh, whereas the runtime really does. Uh, with that in mind, uh, let's go look at the book data service to see how we've sort of condensed everything and, and the sort of the new style a book data service, the new API that's recommended in this version of the application, and then we'll go figure out what this entity manager provider stuff is all about. To get a good overview of a class, it's always best to go to its interface if it has one, because that just strips away all the details. One of the first things you should notice is that all of these using statements they are either the model or they are something from .NET. There's no uh, references to anything that's uh, frameworky, and that's what we should be seeing in, in a repository or data service. But it should only trade in things that are easy to get to and that don't tell you anything about the framework. That's important for testability. As we uh, as we look at it, the other thing that sort of stands out is that uh, all the methods, and they're the same methods. Uh, are driven by the needs of the view model. Nobody sat around and said, geez, I wonder what this data model could deliver in the way of data. I think I'll make up something. Uh, no, it was completely driven by the consumers. So we have here exactly the methods that are used by the view model. And they're the same ones that were used before, uh, including uh, an event actually that is raised whenever the data service knows that there are some pending changes waiting to go to the database. And, and that's only here because the submit button lights up if there are any changes pending. But um, uh, otherwise, we have a save, and oh, there's another difference. Uh, this entire interface has been rewritten so that there are not one callback, as there was in the original, but there are two callbacks. A success path 
and a fail path. And the fail path is always uh, some kind of action callback that's passed in that's going to receive an exception uh, coming back. The, the action may, or may take nothing, or as in this case, it may take a book, a uh, list of books that are coming back. That is the new style favored in this interface and that I recommend to people because the view model shouldn't have to uh, analyze a result to figure out whether it's uh, an error path or a success path. Usually it's only interested in the success path but it has to deal with the error path. And that distinction should be made for it and make it really simple to call. So a, a success path and a fail path is how we do it in the um, refactored version of the bookshelf. Uh, otherwise, all of these methods are exactly as they were. Let's go look at the one and only implementation of iBook Data Service. Uh, there's no design book data service. We only need one. Uh, here in the constructor, it requires that we pass in the uh, well, it's the specialized entity manager for this sample code here called book club entities. Uh, the variable is called context instead of manager, which is what I usually call it, um, because I want you to associate the DevForce Entity Manager with the domain context. They both try and do the same thing, although they do it differently. Uh, so we, we, we get it, and uh, you know we listen for any changes that would be made um, so that we can notify that there have been changes to the views so that they could light up the submit button and so forth. That's pretty much the same. Uh, we won't look at everything here. We'll just pick a representative method just to see how it works. Uh, this is the one that populates the list of books for a given category and it's paged. Um, so the clear paging that's the same but here it begins to look different. Uh, we have some kind of helper method that returns a query of books for that category ID. And then we start modifying that query by, in this case, taking a page size worth of uh, results. And now that we've got a query we like, we uh, use another helper method to run it. Uh, let's go take a look at get books by query. Uh, and now we see what's really different is that uh, this is the kind of query that would have been on a domain service if we had one. In, in, in the re-example, that's where it was. Uh, but in DevForce, you uh, construct your queries on the client side, uh, almost invariably. Uh, to us, that makes more sense because you know what it is that you want to query uh, on the client side. The service really doesn't know. It should just be a, a provider. Uh, not that you can't come up with these on the server side, but that's generally not how it's done. Notice that even the include uh, decision is made here on the client side because whether or not I want to include the associated categories it should be a client side decision, not a server side decision. Uh, just about any query that I can compose uh, that's legitimate on the server side, that would be legitimate for Entity Framework, for example, um, I can compose on the client side. I have uh, none of the restrictions that you would find in RIA. I could do projections and all kinds of things. So uh, this is where I do it, close to where I'm thinking about what it is I want to do um, for my query. Now, this is a really simple one. Uh, I'm just going to get the books where the category ID is the one we're looking for, and I sort it by title. Uh, this will be a data layers uh, sort, and I have my include. So if we go back, uh, we see we get that query, and then we start supplementing it, and uh, then we run it. And running it is uh, pretty straightforward, asynchronous query stuff. We take that query, it knows what its uh, entity manager or context is, and so we say, let's execute it. And uh, we're going to have a callback. And this is what I was talking about earlier. The, it's the data service that should split the result of the callback into a success path, which is this one right here. Or um, if it failed, it should um, uh, figure out what the fail path is. Uh, in the success path, assuming you gave me a, uh, a, a success callback method, then I will give you back the results of the query so that you can do what you wanted to because that's probably what you're interested in. If it failed, um, I'm going to do the mark as handled thing because uh, if you gave me an on fail callback, uh, because I assume you gave me one, you're handling it, and I give you the exception. 
We said that the reason we could use the one book data service was because of the uh, entity manager that we injected into the constructor and that we did that through one of two uh, entity manager providers, the real time one or the design time one. So it behooves us to go look at the uh, entity manager provider now. This is the runtime entity manager provider. And um, that's not too exciting. All it does is uh, instantiate a uh, new book club entities. That's the derived type of the entity manager because uh, that's really all it takes at runtime. Much more interesting is what happens uh, at design time. And this is where we get into our design time services where we have a design entity manager provider. That's new. And if we take a look at that, we, of course, we see that that's more involved because what we're doing is we're going to condition the cache inside the DevForce Entity Manager uh, for design time. We can't go to the service. We have to um, uh, take the Entity Manager and create it offline, that's the false, and then populate it somehow. And the way we uh, can populate it, well, the way that's closest to the way the RIA Services one did it uh, is if we use those design model classes. Here's us doing that. Uh, we're taking our entity manager and we're, we're running the design classes that John provided and we're attaching the results to our entity manager. And the end result of doing that, and this is no more lines of code than there were in the original, is this uh, vision of blend here uh, exactly as John saw it. Now, I uh, recently wrote a blog post in which I showed a, a perhaps richer way of doing that. We can, we don't actually have to have these phony design models. Um, what we can do is we can uh, use something called the entity cache state where I've actually prepared some data and stored it as a resource file. Prepare that data by actually going into our development database and selecting some. And just to get you interested in that, I'm going to uncomment the any cache state version and comment the design mode one and then show you the effect in blend. We're in blend now after we rebuilt the Visual Studio project and now we're looking at the same book view XAML but you can see that it is actually populated in a quite different way. A way that actually kind of looks like the data from the database uh, because it is data from the database, a small sample of it, uh, plus a little modification to prove that we're really in design time. It didn't say developers in Wonderland before. So how did we do this? And if we jump back to Visual Studio, I, I'm not going to show you the whole populate from entity cache state method because uh, I did that in my blog. The key fact is that it's fed by a, um, a representation of the entities that we need for design time that were held in an entity manager cache state, which is something you can do in DevForce. And, and that's actually a resource file that's sitting right here as part of the bookshelf. It's called the design cache state. And if we looked at it, we can see that it's serialized data of some sort. How did I produce that? Well, you can see it's a shortcut, so that's a shortcut to somewhere. Well, where was it? Well, I promised you that there was this other data loader thing out here, and that is the guy that does it, and that's the file right there that we're shortcutting to. Now, this is actually a console app, see, program.cs, and um, it's, a, it's a data loader that knows that file, and all it does when you call load is it creates a new book club entities just like we do in Silverlight, and it just reads in a bunch of... Uh, stuff from the database, from a test database perhaps. Here I'm taking nine books, I don't need all of them. Here's where I change it to Wonderland just to prove that not only can I read them in but I can also tweak them, I can do anything I want in this cache state and when I run it it produces a, a data file. We could, just, um, we could just run this thing if we wanted to see it run. Start new instance. Then it loads the categories books, da -da -da -da, and it tells me all that I need to know. And just like that, I have a good sample from my sample database of data that I can um, design to. Uh, so uh, I can end up with something that looks like this, 
rather than have to fake it with design objects, which means that I could, if I wanted to, um, go back into here and um, blow away uh, all these design models if I wanted to. There is the one more thing that I want to show you, which is that we actually can test our view model. The uh, bookshelf test is a standard Silverlight unit test framework test project. You can learn about uh, Silverlight unit test framework online. You can learn about this particular project in a forthcoming blog post from me. We don't really have time to go into it during the architectural tour, so I'll just give you the quick look. There are two test framework type uh, files in here. There's the model test for looking at the domain model of books and checkouts and all that good stuff. And then there's this very interesting book view model sync test. You know, um, everybody talks about uh, view model and says how wonderful it is for testing, but so few people actually show it. And the reason they don't is that um, book view model leans on things like a data service, uh, which is a pretty complex uh, service uh, for most applications. And uh, they have rich entity graphs, and, and it's very hard when you have a, a rich entity graphs and a, an asynchronous service to fake it uh, or to mock it. You know, very hard, except that it's not that hard in DevForce uh, because of our entity manager and its cache and a queryable cache and the way we can take it offline. And the, the net of it, though, is we're able to take an, an asynchronous service, actually make it execute synchronously while it appears to be asynchronous. That makes a test like, say, this one pretty simple. Uh, notice there's no uh, asynchronous uh, attribute and you don't see any in queues. It just looks like a normal test. I mean, I crank up the view model. I check to see how many books I've got. Uh, it turns out that the, um, the load more button on the view uh, translates to a command. So if I just execute that command, the view model is going to do what it should do, and what it should do is somehow call the data service and get get more books. And, and we'll just know that if at the end of the day, after it's done executing, uh, we have more books. Well, notice I didn't have to wait for anything, by the way. I just go right forward here, even though it's structured asynchronously, but I could just, just do it as if it was synchronous. And yes, I'm still in Silverlight. Pretty cool, huh? And so then I have my assert, uh, and it, so it just looks like a normal test, and I'm exercising uh, various features of the view model. In fact, if you scoot around in here, you'll see that uh, all the properties and methods uh, are uh, are tested. Why don't we go take a look and see uh, you know, what that looks like running? So I'll come down here, and here's that HTML uh, that we have. That's the the host for our uh, test framework, and I'll just view it in browser. And up it comes, and let's run them all. About that, 37 tests passed, of which these are the, there's our load more books. Um, those are the book view model tests. So that's, uh, that's a quick teaser for unit testing, which is actually quite easy with DevForce. Uh, by the way, I know I talked about how you can do this all synchronously, but you know, ultimately, you're going to have to do some end-to-end -end integration tests and you that, use that in queuing stuff. The good news there is that DevForce can help you again because we have a, a fake backing store, so you can go all the way to the server and seem to be saving to the database, but you won't be destroying your database. So, so there's all kinds of testing support in DevForce. Thanks for taking the bookshelf architectural tour. You'll find the bits at links.ideablade.com slash drc bookshelf. There's some other resources that may interest you, beginning with a book, Silver Life 4 Unleashed by Laurent Bognon. I hope I haven't butchered the name. Uh, in particular, Chapter 7, which is on the MVVM pattern, the, he discusses a variety of implementations, uh, one of which is the one used by bookshelf. You'll find the view model locator there. And uh, then there are a series of other uh, resources that I've mentioned throughout the video. The bits again, um, the PDC, uh, John Papa's uh, video of the RIA bookshelf as he did it with RIA. The Firestarter, where a number of people took a shot at doing a bookshelf. Uh, MVVM Lite itself, the bits, can be downloaded here. Uh, the Silverlight Unit Test Framework. And then you can always come to my blog to see what I have to say. Thanks for watching, and come see us at uh, ideablade.com.